Hi. Thank you, Johanna, for introducing me. Thank you to the conference for having me today. And thank you all for deciding to listen to this last talk of this year's event. As most of you have too, I've spent the last two days listening to all the other excellent speakers and what they had to say, and I must say that I'm a little bit nervous now. That's the downside with being last. <laughs> uh, it could be the thing with being last, but also that I haven't spoken like this for a big crowd for quite some years now, you know, the COVID and all of that. But it could also be that when I have spoken in the past, I've generally spoken about what I used to do in the restaurant or about Nordic food culture or about food culture, generally speaking, as being the most important cultural marker of humanity. But what I generally don't do is talking in public about my personal feelings. And I never, ever, ever talk about how damn good I've been at doing certain things in life. This is deeply uncomfortable to me, and I think perhaps very un-Swedish behavior. And both of those things I'm going to do today, because they are both needed for context and for what I really want to say to make sense to you. I think that if I ever have to sit like in a room, if Martin forces me to sit in the room and look at the recording of this afterwards. Like, my last and final wish would be for a shame pillow so that I can moderate <laughs> the intensity of the shame myself. Um, to judge a little how I'm going to proceed next, I thought that I would start by asking all of you how many that already knew who I was before Johanna here introduced me. So please raise a hand. Yeah, that's a, that's a, you can keep them up actually, you can keep them there. That's a, that's a good amount of people. Uh, so of those who didn't know me, had some of you heard about the restaurant Faviken, or if you're American, Faviken? Well, a few more. Uh, so, and lastly, of those who had not had any idea of who I am before or what Faviken was before Johanna called me a food philosopher, had you ever heard of this weird-ass restaurant in the frozen hinterlands of nowhere in northern Scandinavia serving shit like reindeer moss? Yes. Good. Um, I think most people are reasonably well-informed then. But I will still do a small recap about what Faviken was, because that will bring me in a very nice and neat way into what I'm going to talk about today, which is endings and new beginnings. Very suitable topic, I think, for the ending session of an event like this. So, Faviken was a restaurant located on a privately owned mountain estate in the northern parts of Sweden. We had 24 seats in the dining room, which is in its segment of very ambitious fine dining restaurants, very, very small. We were open for five evenings a week, for one seating at seven o'clock, and we served one single surprise tasting menu to the whole dining room at the same time. Most customers, they traveled in from afar, and our average check was around $1,000 per person, not including lodging, which we also supplied for those who wanted it. Faviken was an incredibly successful restaurant, and this I'm not saying just because I was responsible for it, but. I don't even think that I really understood until after we closed just how exceptionally fortunate we were in that respect. When you're in the middle of something like that, also the attention that extreme success gives sadly becomes every day. What we did there was written about at some point by almost every significant outlet of printed media in the world and online. And for television, it was featured first in the PBS series, The Mind of a Chef, and later in the first season of Netflix's first original documentary production, which is called Chef's Table, as Johanna mentioned, which actually still runs, and still is one of their most successful documentary concepts to this day. By every single news media that ever reviewed what we did, we were given reviews ranging from positive to glowing. In 12 years, 
we seriously never had a bad review from aside for like some private individual on Yelp that thought that my hair was too long. But like aside of that, nothing. By one of these lists that I'm sure you've all come across at some point that tries to quantify which restaurant is the very best, which is of course impossible. Um, but the one that my friend Jordi who spoke yesterday has won twice. One year Fabikin was named 16th in the world and by some other lists it was said to be the seventh. And then aside of this, was of course also the Guide Michelin and our, uh, other various sort of awards and accolades. And thanks to all of these things together, this restaurant was full, full, full. The last year when we were open, we operated at 101% occupancy. And this was possible just because aside of the 24 seats, we also started serving single diners on my small collapsible office table in the kitchen, just a meter and a half from the heat of the stove and in the middle of the bustle of the kitchen team. The first half year from when we opened to the public in 2008, the entire team was just I, cooking in the back and then running food and serving in the front. At that point, I could only do one table each night, and all guests were seated together at the communal table, table for eight. Little by little, as our reputation grew, and uh, with that our influx of customers, we added more and more staff, and more and more seats, until we were around 20 people cooking and giving hospitality for 24 guests per night. At this point, a few years in, Faviken, like many other restaurants in its segment, was a very, very tough place to work. We worked 70 to 80 hours a week. The environment was definitely not what could be described as supportive. It was definitely not inclusive. It was definitely not sustainable. And even if it did craft an excellent product for our customers. It consumed the people working there, myself included. I was 24 years old when I became responsible for Fabiken. In retrospect, I was much too young, immature and ill-prepared. Perhaps not for running a passion project with a few employees or even in terms of my own craft of cooking and hospitality, but definitely for what was fast growing into a much more real business. I had several excellent role models when it came to my craft, but none when it came to management and good leadership. Leadership is something that comes naturally to me. It's just one of those unfair things in life. People listen to me. I've done much less than many others to deserve it. But I'm also not one to not take advantage of the fact that this is the way it is. And I did. And I do attribute much of our success with Faviken to this unfair advantage. Management, on the other hand, on, on the other hand which is very often confused with leadership, perhaps because they tend to overlap and intersect, does not come naturally to me. And as a matter of fact, I don't think that it comes naturally to almost anyone. Managing is a skill that you learn. It's a craft, just like cooking or painting or designing or anything else like that. Those role models that I had worked for in the beginning of my career, those who were great cooks, they were also all pretty uniformly terrible as managers and leaders. They were very much in the vein of the caricature that you might be able to imagine if you close your eyes for a second and try to think of an angry chef running a very prestigious kitchen, you know, like in a movie, essentially, but worse. Um, there was lots of shouting and harsh words, very little room for adaptation to the individual, and I was the same. I hadn't seen anything else, and I didn't know anything else. And there are so many people out there who say, and I, I would actually even say that the majority of people, not just in restaurants, do so, that this old-fashioned, hierarchical, 
sometimes aggressive form of leadership doesn't work, that the only thing that works is fair, human, inclusive leadership. But think about it. If it didn't work at all, would it still exist? And within this little contradiction, I think sits one of the great lies of the modern discourse around workplace and leadership. Most things that don't work, they tend to either disappear abruptly or evolve into something that do work. So why isn't all leadership then everywhere, like in one big, happy, mutually respectful rainbow of fluff and pink clouds? Well, it's because in the moment when you need to deliver in a high-pressure situation, pushing people as hard as they can take to the very brink when they're about to snap, it produces excellent results. And I think that, generally speaking, just saying that this type of leadership that I'm talking about now doesn't work without any nuance is one of the worst things you can do if you want it to change. Not acknowledging that moving away from bad leadership is a conscious decision that you have to make every single moment of every single day and not just something that happens because it should happen, is really problematic. And I think a lot of us are guilty of that, me included. Anyhow, I'm sure we've all been in uh, high-pressure situations occasionally where someone have lost it a little or a lot, and where the way that you behaved towards someone or the way that someone behaves towards you didn't feel all right afterwards. It happens. And it will keep happening because we are human. The problem with restaurants is that most of them will find themselves in these high-pressure situations every single evening they're open. Inviting opportunity for this type of behavior to become a habit. A habit that gets passed on from one generation of new managers to another. And the downside with running a team this way, being this type of leader, and manager, not even talking about the personal and ethical side of things, which are both quite obvious, is that it only also works there and then in the moment. Because it consumes people at a very rapid pace, it also puts a best before stamp at anything that you do. It produces the very definition of un an unsustainable workplace. I and some of the others who had been with me the longest at Fab Weekend, we started to come to the conclusion that we couldn't keep going the way we did. We had to change. Or the restaurant would simply cease to exist. We started looking at alternatives and quickly realized that if we wanted to work a reasonable amount, if we wanted to give more support to our team, if I wanted to change the way I conducted my leadership of the organization, we needed more hours. We needed many other things too, but most of all, we needed hours. With almost every little problem we analyzed, it came down at some point to the fact that we did not have the time to do things the right way. We just did them the fastest way, regardless of the human cost. When we analyzed just how much more time we needed, we saw that we needed to double our team. To pay for this without changing the structure of the restaurant too much in other regards, because it was so successful, we saw that we had to increase our menu pricing from 1,800 krona for the food alone, no beverages, which is quite expensive, to 3,300 krona, which is one of the most expensive restaurants in the world. So essentially doubling it. And this was naturally a huge risk, but I felt that we had no real choice in the end, because if we did not act, the time on that best before stamp, it was approaching very, very rapidly. So we decided to launch our new pricing model and prepared for the big change for the next time when we had uh, an opportunity to release reservations. Uh, this happens twice a year, once in spring and once in fall. And the way we did it was that we usually sent out a newsletter sometime in advance with the time and date that the new seats would become available online. And then on the day, 
we had the whole front of house team at their computers, led by our reservations manager, just answering emails and helping people to find seats. We would usually be completely sold out for the coming season of 2,500 to 3,000 seats prepaid and ready within a few hours. I was incredibly worried <laughs> about this upcoming change in pricing. I prepared defensive statements detailing what the money would be used for if some journalist made a story of it. And I prepared a bunch of suitable replies and comebacks for whatever comments that social media would generate on the matter or that people would email directly to us. The day when we released reservations some weeks later with the new price, nothing happened. Nothing! And I mean nothing in the sense that nothing changed. Like, we booked out equally quickly, no journalist wrote about it, and not even a single comment on social media alluded to the fact that we had almost doubled our price overnight without saying anything to anyone. I was shocked. But I was also delighted. Um, <laughs> and we started recruiting 23 new staff members. We uh, implemented 40-hour work week with a 10-hour cap of overtime, fully paid. And we uh, unionized the restaurant and got ourselves a collective agreement to make sure that we stuck to what we set out to do and weren't tempted to half-ass it. Very good. I can say that the, the person that picked up the phone at the Restaurant Workers' Union's office in Örnsköldsvik was very surprised that I called and asked her to help unionize my employees. <laughs> but it was good. Um, and then aside of that, we also put in place a lot of other measures uh, to move from this extractive organization to one, one that was still equally ambitious and hardworking, but fair and nice. And it wasn't easy, and it wasn't always perfect in the end. And it wasn't like people came up to me and told me or anything. But over the years to come, I could see that our efforts paid off by one specific, very simple metric. People stopped leaving. And we went from a place where many stayed for six months and nine months for like, uh, you know, sort of World Cup level of endurance uh, to one where people just stayed and the year started piling on. To me, the final proof that what we did actually worked came the day or perhaps rather the week when we closed the restaurant in 2019. Six months before the date, we had collected a team for uh, a day together in preparation of the coming season, as we always did for every season. And when I told them the news, I explained my reasoning behind the decision and what it would mean to them. That the restaurant would not be there six months from now and that they would no longer have a job. I told them that they should expect offers from elsewhere when the news were made public and that if those offers were any good, they should take them. I told them that it was not my res or <coughs> I told them that it was my responsibility to keep Fabric and functioning to the end and not theirs. I mean, we had anticipated that some people would leave, and therefore we had also recruited uh, a bit excessively to a degree of overstaffing. So we were pretty confident that we were going to sort of make it work till the end. On the day that the restaurant closed, the same 43 people who attended that day six months earlier cooked for the last 24 guests at Favikan. And a few days later, when I approved the final payroll, it struck me just how long some of them had worked there. A handful of people had been with the business and me for seven to nine years. Ten had been there for about five years, so a little bit longer. And most of the rest of them had been there for two to three years. And maybe for all of you, this doesn't sound like very long in your professions. I don't know. But in high-end hospitality, this is like a lifetime. This is a very, very, very long time and a very unusual thing. We had gone from a place where you came to work to see it and get it on your resume and get out to a place you just didn't leave. And this, it's by far my proudest professional moment. So why am I telling you all of this when we are supposed to be talking about endings and new beginnings? Well, it is because I want you to understand just what it was that I ended when I closed Favikan. 
we had this place that was pretty much as critically, critically acclaimed and respected as it could have been. It was full every day. It was a fun and pleasant place to work for me with people I knew and loved and had known for a long time. It was a, a business that supported my family and myself very comfortably. It was a place that opened doors for me in the world that would without it have remained locked and that f allowed me to meet a lot of very interesting people. It was a business that gave me the opportunity to write and publish six books with one of the greatest modern publishers, Fight and Press. I got to tell and to some degree, large or small, influence hundreds of millions of people. And these are very big numbers now, but I'm not over exaggerating. Through the restaurant, through television, through these books, and through all other media that reported on us and what we did, my thoughts about what was important were amplified and had real impact. It was lastly a place that offered me complete creative freedom. I could literally do whatever I wanted and act on almost any idea I had. I think that what I had in Faviken was perhaps what most people who work in creative or craft-driven fields dream of but never attain. And then, despite all that, I fell out of love. It was a process. It didn't happen overnight. But I could feel it, and I resisted. I tried to influence it. I tried telling myself how fortunate I was. I tried ignoring it. And then one morning when I woke up, I just knew I couldn't go on anymore. And I wrote about this moment previously, and it has been published, so some of you might have read it already, but I thought that uh, I would read it out here anyways, because it really sums it all up. So I have my little cheat sheet here. <coughs> the first light of the morning was long gone already and had been overtaken by the full force of the early summer sun. This is the way it is up north that time of year. The sun barely sets at night and then bounces right up again. The room was warm when I woke up in that stifling way that makes you feel like you're sick even though you aren't. That way that makes it seem like there is just not enough air between the walls for someone to live. The lashes on my left eye were stuck together and I had to brush my finger over them to make my eye open. The phone was buzzing its irritating wake-up call under the mattress where it lives at night. And I turned it off and looked at the time. 7.09. I had apparently hit the snooze once without realizing it. Perhaps I hit the button unaware from the drowsiness of waking, or perhaps accidentally by rolling onto that part of the mattress. I lay there and stared at the ceiling. And then out the window on some trees. And then back at the ceiling again. Tove had already left for the university, and it was my job to get the kids to school today. I could hear that they were up already. Good, I thought to myself. And I heard the sound of spoons on porcelain, so they were eating even better. I hoped that the oldest two were helping their younger brother, and I decided to get out of bed, like any other morning. But then something happened that I'd never experienced before. I couldn't get up. I just couldn't move. Or perhaps rather, I couldn't make myself sit up and move out of bed. It was such a strange thing. It wasn't like I was physically paralyzed or anything. I mean, I could flop my body around just fine lying there. But as opposed to how it usually works any other day, you know, you form a thought and it decides to get up. And then with sort of some uh, level of automatic response, you get up. Physically, today nothing happened. I just lay there. I felt scared in a way that I had only ever experienced twice before. Scared that there was something wrong with me, for real. The first time I felt this way was that time when I woke up and everything tasted of metal and I thought I was having a stroke, which was pine mouth. If you've never had it or heard about it, you should Google it. Um, the second time was worse, and it was when I had been swimming in a very famous rock star's dirty swimming pool at the party and gotten an inner ear infection that spread to the vestibular nerve in my, uh, and like made the whole world spin. And I also thought I was having a stroke. 
uh, I lay in bed knowing that something was wrong, but not knowing what. And then I forced my body into submission. When I finally did manage to sit up, I put a t-shirt on and a pair of running shorts. And I drove Arne, Ella, and Edwin to school and preschool without my shoes on, and the whole time with tears burning behind my eyelids. I've never had a problem crying in front of my kids. I cry very easily when I'm upset or when something sad happens, and I'm very fine with that. But today, I found myself trying hard not to. I think that I didn't want them to see, because I knew that this was another kind of sad and another kind of fright. And it was something that I couldn't explain to them, something that was unfamiliar and that they wouldn't understand, because I didn't understand it. It was a kind of sadness that I had never felt before. When I got home, I went straight to bed and cried. And then I slept until the clock turned two, and the sound of the door woke me up when my son came home again. He thought it was strange that I was home and that I was sleeping, but I shrugged him off and sat down in front of the computer as if I was working. I was just sitting there, not reading, not writing, not looking something up online, just sitting there, acting busy, pretending to work. I didn't go to Fabiken that day, and I didn't call to say I wasn't coming in. I just couldn't make myself. Later, when Tove came home, I told her that I had a headache and that I thought I was coming down with something. She looked at me very suspiciously, because I don't get sick very often, and, and if I do, I generally tend to work anyways. The following day was an exact repetition of the first, and the third day that followed too. And as I lay there in bed, on the morning of the fourth day, I realized that I didn't even want to get out of bed anymore. To get up and drive the kids to school felt suddenly very hard even though I had done so the three days before. To do that, and then go to work after, it felt unachievable. It felt like climbing the summit of some impossibly tall mountain, unaided by oxygen, or maybe even carrying like a CO2 tank, like an anchor, to make it harder. I knew then and there that it had to stop. Um, I understood that my restaurant, the one that I had loved for 11 years, had to close soon. I lay there for another 45 minutes, listening to, kids, to the kids, watching television downstairs, trying to figure out how to deal with the incredible sadness induced by this realization. So, when people read this, or hear it, most seem to immediately tend to jump to the conclusion that I was burned out, that I had worked too much, that I had a depression, things like that, and I can really understand why. But this wasn't quite that. This was the overwhelming sadness over a lost love that would never come back, and the realization that I had to change. Not because of any practical reason, or because I particularly wanted to, but because of that lack of love. And practically speaking, I could probably have kept Fabiken on autopilot going for many years not spending time or engaging emotionally with it, like a lot of chefs or other creatives eventually end up doing with whatever it is that they've created, become successful by, and eventually fallen out of love with. But I just could not imagine myself existing like that. And I must say that I'm very happy that I did close it, and that it did end. Me falling out of love with the restaurant of my life, the restaurant then that in itself gave me so many opportunities, has almost given me more after it stopped existing. I've thought a lot about this process with Fabiken afterwards, how privileged I was to get to choose the end of my project, that I had partners who understood and backed my decision, that a sudden change in trends or perhaps the pandemic didn't dry up my customer base, or that I didn't let the place slowly decline until it self-imploded. The thing, though, is that as much as I'd like to tell myself that this was rational, conscious decision to close, that it was time for practical reasons, it wasn't. It was purely an emotional decision. And this is really what I would like to talk about today. 
because I think that this conflict between emotions and conscious rationality is at the core of what it means to be a human in the 21st century. As a species, we have a number of tools to guide us through life. One is that we're really great at gathering data without knowing that we do so, and then subconsciously analyzing this data. A process that goes on at the back of our minds all of the time, regardless if we want to or not. It is what gives us our ability to sense when something is wrong around us and when something needs to change. This is perhaps what made us so successful from an evolutionary perspective, I don't know. But I can definitely see how it was probably a very useful thing for a hunter-gatherer to feel when something needed to change, and then changing it immediately, rather than sitting down in a meeting uh, and having a very elaborate and lengthy conscious fact-gathering process that ultimately led to the same decision being made, just more slowly. But today, the world around us requires a rational argument and explicit reasons for almost every change, big and small. And I can also understand why that's needed. But I also do think that this is often counterintuitive to the way humans are meant to work, and most often actually do work, even if we pretend otherwise. I would in fact go as far as saying that I believe that most of the decisions that most of us make every single day they are emotionally based rather than based on a conscious analysis of an array of facts presented to us and then carefully weighed against one another. But for us to motivate, motivate these emotionally based decisions, both to ourselves, but perhaps mostly for others, we often try to rationalize them afterwards to make them explainable and thereby socially acceptable. Think about it yourselves. Think about some decision that you made recently and what that process looked like. And not just something like you eating a croissant and drinking coffee in the morning because you feel like it even though you know that oatmeal and water would be better for you, but something more important, something bigger. Perhaps uh, you know, some well-prepared decision you made at work. Perhaps uh, that you decided to buy a new apartment. Perhaps that you decided to propose to your theoretically perfect partner in life after much weighing of pros and cons. Deep down, if you really think about it, didn't you already know before all of the evidence was listed, all of the decision points lined up, what that decision was going to look like? When I spend time thinking about the process of ending something, and especially the end of Havik, and I think that this is what I can take away from it going forward. If I'm completely honest with myself and with you, I knew long before that morning I told you about that the restaurant had to close. But it wasn't until I couldn't go on any longer that I started rationalizing so that I could articulate to myself and to everyone else why we had to close. I am 100% certain that if I had listened to my instincts, if I had chosen not to suppress the emotions that started telling me long before that particular day that it was time to make some changes, I would have been better off. And I don't mean that I should have on that day in perhaps 2016 or whenever it was that I first felt it, that, should I, that I should have just called my business par partners and resigned on the spot. Not like that. The unique magic with the human intellect is that we can use our conscious mind to evaluate what these subconscious processes are telling us. If I had trusted those early emotions and perhaps allowed myself to investigate them further, rather than ignoring them, pushing them back or trying to write them off as being irrational, I would have come to the inevitable conclusion much faster and perhaps in a slightly less dramatic way for myself and those close to me. And perhaps the decision to close would have been made a year or so before what came to be the case. Perhaps the wear and tear on myself would have been less severe. And perhaps this delay in my decision cost me an opportunity that I will now never know of, or put me at unnecessary risk. I mean, just a, a, a quick and very obvious example. Just imagine if I had continued thinking about this for like another half year before my body told me that I had to acknowledge these emotions and subsequently also 
told the world another half year that later that I would close the following spring instead, the spring of 2020. Then the last six months of the business would have been during the COVID pandemic. No international travel, no access to my normal customer base. It would have cost me millions of kronas in deficits. And since the restaurant was going to close anyways, I would have had no chance in making that money back. And as Carolyn mentioned yesterday, time is not money, it is life. And a year lost not doing something truly meaningful to you is a year lost of the most valuable thing you have. If I were to live to the age of the average man in Sweden, which is 81.7, uh, it means that by squandering one year, I also squandered 181.7th of that, the most valuable thing I had. Time does matter. I, I guess that what I'm trying to say by all of this is that we humans have an amazing ongoing subconscious research process that incorporates every single little moment we experience in our lives. And that gives us hints and direction on how to act in the form of sensations and emotions. I think that we should stop working against ourselves by almost always assuming that our own much more shallow, incomplete, conscious evaluation processes are always better. And try to remember that decisions based on a subconscious process sometimes might be much more difficult to articulate to someone else and therefore more difficult for you, the receiver, to immediately understand. We should collectively try to respect that an emotionally based decision can be actually be just as rational as one that we have produced consciously and just as good. Thank you so much for listening. I will say thank you. And I will say, I know you have something else on your mind, so go right ahead. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> uh, just before I open up for a few questions and let Johanna take over and organize that, I actually have one last thing to add. I've mostly spoken about endings now, and endings tend to lead to new beginnings. But I haven't said much about those. Because when I wrote this, the first draft ended up at 17,831 words, <laughs> uh, which is like two hours of me solidly babbling on without any break. So much of it had to go. But now when I'm officially not on the clock anymore, because you've applauded <laughs> and uh, we're like done, um, I'm, I'm going to steal like a little more of your time. And and there, I think, is very little you can do about this besides leaving, which is rude, or Johanna wrestling me on stage, which could happen. Um, so as you've seen, I've not had any slides today, but up there in the sun, there is a QR code. And some of you might have scanned it already, that's fine if you're curious. But this QR code represents one of my new beginnings. So the first of those beginnings is being that half of my time, I run a certified organic apple orchard that produces several hundred tons of great apples for eating and cider making. And the second one is that on the other half of my time, I am responsible for the world's largest environmental award, which is called the Food Planet Prize. You look a little bit surprised now. Uh, when I say the world's biggest environmental award, it's like you never heard of this before, which is probably correct. Because unlike other global awards coming out of Sweden, like perhaps the Nobel Prizes, which have had something like a hundred years to get famous and fancy, this year is only the third for this prize to happen, and the first since I became responsible for it. I think you will see a lot more of this in the future, because this prize is really unique amongst other significant monetary awards and grants. We give out two prizes a year, two million US dollars each. And the first thing that's unique is that the world's largest environmental award can only ever go to projects within the food system. Projects that lessen the environmental impact of the way we eat. And this is like very simply because no other human activity today creates more environmental problems than the way we eat. And we need to keep eating. To not eat is not a choice we have. The second thing is that we award people or projects for their potential to make change, if they just get the chance. We don't award 
projects that made change like five years ago, which weirdly enough is what most other awards and prizes do. We take much more risk because that is needed if we want to turn things around. The third unique thing is that the jury that will vote on the 10 finalists selected by our team every year to decide the winner, they represent the whole food system. And this means in broad terms that half of the jury comes from academia and policy making, which could be referred to as the usual suspects in this context. And then the other half comes from practical applications within the food system, which are like grossly underrepresented in foundations and boards that decide where money goes. So a vote from someone like myself, former chef, or from Yina Yuni, a young female winemaker from California, weighs equally heavy in deciding who gets these prizes as that of, let's say, Johan Rockström, one of the most acknowledged climate scientists of his generation and my co-chair in the jury. Lastly, all the nominees that we examine every year are brought to us from people who nominate either themselves or someone else that they think should win this prize. It is a true grassroots movement in that sense, where we, rather than us going out in the world with a colonialistic sort of mindset, looking for the stuff that we believe will make a difference and probably end up missing most of the best initiatives that will actually end up disrupting the way our food system works today. Our job is much more about listening to what the world tells us and then trying to understand these many nominees as best as we can with open eyes and a minimum of preconceptions to try to figure out which of them that actually has the biggest potential to make change, if only they get the chance. I really, really, really want you to pick up your phone, scan the code, which leads to our nominations page. And then perhaps later, when you have a moment, when we're done here, you just go in and nominate someone. Thanks. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We have time for some questions. I will ask you one first. You said you fell out of love uh, with this work, but then I wonder if really it, another way of thinking of that, in case it's too fluffy for some folks, let's step into the light, come on, come on, is that you fell out of meaning somehow. Yeah. Is love I and meaning the same in this context? I, well, I think that they are definitely intertwined and sort of uh, impossible to separate in that case, yeah. Yeah, great. Let's have a question from the room. You know the drill by now. I don't need to remind you. I, I think you're allowed to ask like food and restaurant questions, even though. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> In shock. Yeah. In shock. You, you're a shy bunch. Oh, well, there is one there. There's one yeah. question right there on the right. Yeah. I was going to wait for someone else to like break the ice, but <laughs> um, I'm, uh, my name is Anna Blix. I'm a gender equality and diversity consultant. And um, I was thinking about what you said about like, well, feelings um, and how we all, or I mean, I guess the majority of the room can recognize being at a workplace where you don't like enjoy your everyday life or where you are too stressed or like, yeah, just don't want to go there. <laughs> um, and we we rarely make the decision to leave until we have a new opportunity. Mm. So most people like endure these terrible workplaces just to like wait for the next opportunity. Okay, I'm ready to leave. So what would you say? Like, how do how do you think we can change that? and like leave something without having something new. Well, that's the difficult part, isn't it? Because that's about privilege. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was privileged enough to run this company like successfully. So I had resources that made it possible for me to act on this, like this process that happened and just leave. And I knew that, you know, I could sort of, uh, make it work for myself and the family for a little bit, and then something new would probably come along. And I think a lot of people don't have that opportunity, or I know that a lot of people don't have that opportunity. So I think that's just like one of the great, great unfairnesses in this whole situation. Um, but I also at the same time think that even if you can't always act as sort of definitively, definitively as I did, 
and just like close a whole business that has 70 employees because you don't love it anymore, which is like ridiculous and privileged. But you can always act in some way. It doesn't have to be that you leave every time. It can be a process that you start or that you start getting in touch with like this sort of emotions and these processes and try to understand them more and so on. Uh, it's funny. I mean, I, I think you're of course right, but it's also funny that you think of this in terms of privilege. Clearly you are and were in that situation quite privileged, but even so your body was shutting you yeah. down. Yeah. So, uh, so if you had been an employee in your own kitchen on day four of not being able to leave bed, that person would have gone on sick leave yeah. indefinitely. Absolutely. And I mean, I guess that's another kind of privilege, globally speaking, to live in a welfare state like ours, where yeah. where you will be caught by the system. Yeah. But yes. but then that's yeah. Oh, oh yes. It's, it's, it's these are very difficult. But I mean, things, a, a another mm. counter example of that, a place you know, the United States, which does not have a great employment security. There, we have seen this great resignation. Mm. Uh, and that shifted the whole dynamics of the labor market when people started to just say, stop, no, I can't do this anymore. Mm. So there's something there. Another question. Yes, please, here down in the middle. Let's do it from the left this time. Yep. Just, uh, please keep waving so the microphone... Please keep waving. There we are. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Magnus. I know Magnus very well. Hi, Matt. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm just curious because... And, uh, so my name is Matt Orlando. I, I own a restaurant in Copenhagen called Amass. And um, I'm, I'm just curious in this whole leaving part. And, you know, when you own a restaurant, it's very much an extension of your identity, your personal identity. And your, and I know this because I own a restaurant, and your ego is directly attached to that identity and by default the restaurant. Yeah. And so when you close, and I don't speak of ego in a negative way, just to set the context here. It's just everyone has an ego and everyone's aware of themselves. And, but when you, when you go through that process where you're essentially sh closing a part of your identity and uh, potentially closing certain doors that were open because of that, what, is that, what does that process look like and, and how did you deal with that? Hmm. Well, for me, like, it was so definitive at the end. Uh, so I never really even thought about it, to be honest. But what I realized afterwards, which is one of the only sort of implications with this that I really had a difficult time handling, was that when you run a restaurant like that, there's going to be like 20 people every day that tells you that you're great, <laughs> that you're doing great things and that you're awesome. And, you know, this sounds really weird, but it, it's, uh, you become addicted to that. And... Closing the restaurant and not having that, you know, it, after that it was Tobe and my wife saying that I did something great like maybe once a month if I was lucky. <laughs> uh, and, and like <laughs> the discrepancy is huge and it made me like pretty miserable for a while before I kind of came to terms with it, actually. Yeah. Do you feel internally, I'm sorry this turns into like a therapy session, <laughs> do, you, do you feel internally now that you're great? Yeah, I'm much better. Like definitely. Because maybe I still this is it. a healthier way of l of being great, right? I, well, it comes from so. you, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think so. But I, s I can still miss it. It can still be like you know when uh, when I go to another restaurant, for example, and I see that sort of customer relationship, the customer chef relationship. I can still feel that, and I can miss it. But uh, I don't feel it every day now, and I it's not something that I think about really. I, I do notice that as you're talking about this, you're uncomfortably backing away from the light. So let's go back to the front again. <laughs> okay, we can do one more, I think, uh, or maybe possibly two. Let's do one here first, further back. Yeah, that's that's right. And then just in front of you afterwards. Hello, my name's Christina. I'm a design and development specialist. So what's your favorite food to eat? My favorite food to eat mm -hmm. is rice porridge mm -hmm. yes. with the uh, yeah. fake cinnamon and sugar and uh, milk. Semi-skimmed. Uh, what you call fake cinnamon is what yeah. most of us would just call cinnamon. Yes, yes. the cassia yeah. cinnamon. That's I right. don't like yeah. real cinnamon. Yeah. <laughs> and then right in front of her. Hi, my name is Lucy. I'm an architect. I wonder how you um, archive food when you have done a restaurant that has cultural significance. It seems important to be able to preserve oh. some of that, but the food can only be eaten once. Well, it's uh, like there are there are two things. Like one is that every single menu that was ever served at Thavikan uh, is, has been kept. So there is like a record of like the succession over 12 years of what happened there. Um, and uh, and then I didn't really think about this until like the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But I was fortunate enough to get to write like the, my first book about Favik and quite early, only four years into the restaurant. So that like automatically chronicled quite a lot. And then uh, I got to write another book like 10 years later that was also called Favik, and, but which unlike the first book that was about the restaurant that barely existed, the second book was about one that didn't exist anymore. And together they've kind of archived or chronicled most of it pretty well in both photography and text. Is there some kind of, I mean, I suppose there's not a national archive of like food culture or something like that, but. I don't know, but I mean, the the books, sort of books like that end up in our national archive, yeah. in, like the Royal Library and stuff. So they are there, but I guess that they probably weed them out after like 20 or 30 years or something. I, I, don't I don't know. know. In the Royal Library, <laughs> it's supposed to be forever. So that's something. At Imagine least. how big it would be after a while. Huh? No, I was super <laughs> worried about like where do where do are your menus? Like where will they go over time? National archives might want them. I'm just saying that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, now they're on uh, like one single computer, like with no backup. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone in the room who works with tech is like, no, <laughs> Magnus, no. <laughs> and I didn't want to end this by saying, Magnus, no. So <laughs> some fine. people are going to come up to you and talk to you about backups. <laughs> All <Yeah>. right. <laughs> Thank you ever so much for these endings and beginnings. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Magnus Nielsen. Thank you.